It's episode 22 of the Improv London podcast with this week's guest, Vicky Wright. This ain't gonna be easy. Some boys moving around. Welcome to episode 22. This week I speak to Vicky Wright of Making Faces Theatre. We explore the link between our imaginative space and our posture. And we talk about returning to the same character when you uh, use the same mask year after year. And uh, also discuss, are masks medicine? Vicky Wright, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So before we began, you were asking me, what did I know about masks? Right, yeah. And my answer to that is I don't know anything about masks at all, apart from they seem kind of cool, scary and a bit weird. Right, what a good summary. What a good summary. <laughs> um, have you ever done anything? Like, have you ever performed in a mask? What, you've seen no. masks? Or? No, I've just seen them around. Right, right, yeah. And masks are one of those things that for predominantly a lot of people, they go, oh, God, that's really weird. Or we know them from films that are really, really scary or freaky. Or we know them from the like anonymous movement where you've got more of the V for Vendetta um, thing going on. But actually, masks, are, for myself anyway, are a completely different thing. It's more of a training tool for performers. So mm-hmm. the, with masks, you can put on a full mask. So it's, it's one that covers the whole face. And the actual um, dimensions of it, it creates like a different, a different face, a different right. character. And when someone plays it, it suddenly comes alive. They take on the body of the mask, as it were. And in some ways, and this is, this is why it's so important for training, um, theatre performance is really, it trains the performer to take on the body of that character, rather than just cinemographic, very you know, extreme facial movements. Um, it's more, it's actually about expressing it through body language, through movement, uh, through qualities of tension in the body as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really what we communicate the whole time as human beings. So it's really tapping into that. Cool. And so how did you first get into masks? What first drew you to masks? What's so, your mask origin story? Right, yeah, of course. Because I wasn't born, I didn't, you know, <laughs> come out of the room and go, oh my God, I've got to do masks. <laughs> no, nothing like that. Um, I was out in Italy. I was training at a school called Helicos for three years, and it's a Lecoq-based school. And within that, they trained us for masks. Do you want to just explain for those that don't know about Jacques Lecoq? Yes, of course. Yeah. So Jacques Lecoq uh, was actually someone who defined a lot of different theatre genres in the last century. And his main school is over in Paris. And when he died in 1999, there was a number of schools that have come out of that. So there's about five or six around the world. And with the Lecoq-based theatre, it really goes from exploring the human being, but from the physical side of things. So it breaks down the training in terms of, an example is, um, for a small, small section, you might look at different elements and how fire moves, how air moves, how water moves, how earth moves. And by becoming that element, um, it's, it's a way of tapping into a different character. Wow. And it's also a way of stepping back and you begin to see human behaviour. Say, for example, someone getting into an argument, they might suddenly, their breath might get higher in their body. They might suddenly go, ah, and be more fiery in a certain way. Another example is if you look at the dynamics of a football match, and you see a crowd and they're, they're a winning crowd and you know, kind of, they get really excited and they're about to score a goal. The actual action of the whole crowd, the choral movement, is very fire-like. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. And you can see elements transition in human behaviour all the time. So, for example, if you saw that crowd and they suddenly got really excited and, oh, are they getting, oh my God, is there a goal, is there a goal? Oh, there's not a goal. And with that, you've got, say for example, you've got a crowd and they're getting very excited and they're about to win. And then actually, they miss the final thing, they leave the match, and there's this suspension in the air. Almost as if, just like being sitting on a fire side, you've got fire, and then suddenly it all goes to smoke and ash, and you've got this really suspended kind of forlorn, airy feeling that comes through and you can see, you know, how do people walk leaving a football match when their, their, their home side is lost? 
there's a silent quality. People aren't bubbly. People aren't, mm. oh, yeah, great, yeah, let's go to the pub. It's more like, oh, you know, let's just, oh, mm. Mm. you know? There's a different uh, ambience. Right, cool. Um, so those, that's a small example. So Jacques Lecoq looked at the different different qualities of the human being and really went, went through those different layers. So there's another one is animals, looking at how different people can be likened to different animals. And wow. It's a great tool if you're... Um, for performance when you go off either in, in theatre or film is it's an internal mm. uh, focus and with that you don't have to explain oh by the way I'm going to focus on this <laughs> but it's a great way of stepping outside your own identity right, and yes. your own movement patterns and it goes it takes you into, into a bigger bigger place really so I might imagine that I'm going to do this performance but inside I am a tiger right yeah and how does a tiger move is that, is it that yes, literal? and it, it might, yeah. yeah. And it, what may, what the people may see from the outside, is actually, wow, he's really powerful. Like mm. he's a really powerful, you know, kind of financial boss. I do or, get that a lot. He's this, I bet. <laughs> so it's the financial bit, but you know. I did meet you in Think Tiger. You yeah, know? <laughs> well, that's, uh, it's very nice of you to say. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so it's it's a really great tool. So. <laughs> That's um, that's an, kind of a little glimpse of the Jacques Lecoq work, mm, sure, and yeah, yeah. within that is there's um, a whole series of different masks. So uh, within the first type of masks are something called larval masks or naive masks, and they're these white masks that almost if you had, if you were just to create a blank piece of paper, although it's a three-dimensional piece of paper, and just make one movement out of it. So it might be a really big forehead, or it might be, you know, kind of oh, really grounded in the, the chin, or it might have those different movements. The the white masks are used um, as a way of exploring one emotion, right. or one movement dynamic in the face. And then, so it's a really great, you know, kind of it's the early the early part of masks. So when you say it's one emotion. Is that defined? Uh, where does this emo is the um, emotion chosen by the director, by an actor, by the mask? So these white masks are from Basel in Switzerland, and they are festival masks. But in terms of so, from a mask making perspective, it's just exploring a character. It's exploring a movement, and yeah, it's very much you're you're looking at just one direction of movement. So it might be the gravitational force down, or it might be a really elevated force up. And yeah, that's that's the first level of masks. Really. So the, the definition, uh, so the, the the emotion is defined in the creation of the mask. Yes. So just to come on to this. Go on. So as an overview of masks. So the first one is the white masks that we've got, which is like one one emotion. And then from there, you've got full masks. So you've got full character masks, and they have actually different different movements or different you know kind of patterns in space. It's almost like architecture hmm. and building and, and creating different uh, volumes of movement. But those different volumes, when you put it on a, on a face, create different characters. And that's the fascinating thing, hmm. is stepping into another person's shoes. Um, there's also half masks, which uh, they are only covered up from the top down to the mouth. And so it allows the performer to speak. And so it creates the, the vocal quality as well. And then you've also, within that genre of half masks, you've got very famously Camille de Latte masks, which are masks that were created over Venice um, and uh, hundreds of years ago, and they're leather masks. And they, um, they take on different archetypes from the society. And what I find for myself personally, they're really, really wonderful kind of big masks. But really, it's just like Little Britain or something or, or something like that today, hmm. where they're just archetypes of what they, you know, you've got the secretary, you've got computer said no, you know, you've got these different things. You've got the, in, in Camino Gelato, you've got the doctor, you've got the old man, you've got these different ones. And sometimes when I find studying or, and exploring that area, it can seem a little bit far off because our society's changed so much. But actually, you know, if you bring it into the real, mm. everyone finds it hilarious, you know, <laughs> the, the air hostess or the this or that. You know, it's just about types in society and playing with them. Mm. Yeah. So, so, yeah, that, that's the, the kind of overview of masks. The final one being the red nose. Right, yes. Red the, nose the red nose, that's red a nose mask. Clown. Yes. Oh, how does yeah. that work? In that, it is the smallest, it is the smallest mask. Mm. Um, it masks are a training tool for performers but they are also in some way 
a layer of protection as well for the for the inside performer. And yeah, that's very much for the for the red nose. Um, they it's a state it's a statement that it is not you. Right, okay. And that is a mask. So so are all masks protection, or is it just the red nose that's protection? Oh no, they are all. Yeah. So when you put on something, you can express more freely, because hmm. in some ways it's not you. Yes. Right? Yes. So it's, it, but that's the quality of the, the red nose as a mask. Yeah. Right. That's really interesting. Um, clowning in general comes up quite a lot on this podcast, huh. and I always express my terror of it. <laughs> but, which just means the more I talk about it, the more it means I just wanted to give it a try. But I... I <laughs> I, I'm not sure I want to go through that negation of self <laughs> or the right. being. I don't know. I'm not scary. sure. Scary. No, it is yeah. scary. And also, like as a performance tool, um, masks. You've got you've got to be very clever if you're going to use masks as a performance tool. Yeah. It's got to be really oh, right. really well done um, because a, a large part of it is they're they're very good for training. Mm. And it really depends if you're going to choose to do a very traditional mask. Uh, or a very re- you know kind of regular mask, it's got to be uh, masked very well. So you've got to, it's got to be very convincing. I find if you can see the mask, right, and it and it there isn't the level of play behind it, then it may not it's it may not be working on stage. That's yeah. that's the element of danger. Yes, um, and that's uh, and I'd not thought about the two sides of it. I'd not thought about it as a training tool than as a performance tool. I don't know, I don't know what I thought, uh, <laughs> which is fine. Which is why why we're talking on this podcast. Um, Okay, so so um, you talk about it as, as a training tool. What yeah. what what do masks? And what's your? Because you have a theatre making faces. Yeah, theater, making theater, faces theatre. Tell yeah. me about that. Yeah, so I when I was out in Italy, I trained up as a mask maker. So oh, you make um, them as well. Yeah, so right. I, I make them. Cool. And um, and that's you can find out more information at making faces theatre. We'll, uh, put the link in the show notes. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, But also, I come to theatre from a very different background. I come from uh, theatre from movement therapy. Oh, right, cool. And from working with with posture and the structure of the body. And it really, uh, mask is a way. There is this really incredible mask um, called the neutral mask, which when worn, it can hold all emotions. But when it's worn by different people, it looks different. Wow. And it's a, it's a rather incredible thing, but what it is, in essence, it's showing is actually the information we pick up from the body language and the body posture. And there's this uh, really wonderful set of really small adjustments that can be made and kind of rebalancing the body spatially. Um, but then that image or that archetype or that emotion suddenly disappears. And the, the physical presence of the performer on stage, it's almost like their bubble, their, their bubble of a human being suddenly like mag- magnifies mm. in some way. And that's really incredible. It, it's incredible to see um, as a, you know, kind of just a person within the room, but it's also incredible to feel, mm. um, to suddenly go, oh, right, actually, I really come forward or I come back or I can breathe into this area. Or, oh, I've never noticed it, but huh, that is good. And that is also, Within this work, it's it's about training, it's about learning, exploring the body, and mm. exploring the tools that we have, mm. and also when we want to use what. Right. Uh, so if we find, oh, actually, we've got this position, this posture in my body naturally, then it's great to know that, know what archetype or what emotion would come really easily, because then as a performer you can access that and you can go, actually, right now. I'm really good as a hero. Well, actually, there's a really wonderful, like, spiral movement going on, and that works really well as the villain, or, you know, got different different work, or certain qualities, actually, you know, kind of, it works really well if I, for these emotions, or for these characters, or, and that's, so it's, it's possible to use this work to discover what characters really come naturally to you. Yes. And also, if you're going to be working in choral movement, so as a, you know, kind of, as a group, it's really useful to know actually how can I neutralize or how can I you know, balance that dynamic so that actually as a group we don't see all these different characters but we just see a group movement as a whole fully supporting each other. Right. So, so if you're doing that sort of group movement you could try and embody the same sort of archetype 
represented by a mask? Is that more a thing? You could so it's something. It's called a neutral mask, oh, yeah. and it's the. It would be you'd be referring to it as, as neutral. You'd as a performer, you uh, would aim to go into a, a so-called neutral body. Right. Um, to it's a, it's a state of, of real presence and real listening. But as a group, it it allows um, very good choral movement, and then from there you can as a for the director they can then put on different characters or different or a different story on stage but if there's a very strong character you know if there is, is a group of very very strong characters and they're not aware of it there's already a lot of story on stage right yes so you, it's important to know what you're saying then yes and you don't want the people in the chorus to be pulling focus when they've actually got precisely in front. right yes and that can go from physical movement and it can also when you work chorally go from timing Right. So if someone's always on the offbeat, then they they will assert, you know they will become a certain character within that group. Yes, yes. Um, we've talked before on this podcast about embodiment, right? And things like that. And so um, it's very interesting how um, the body influences the mind, and then we've got the masks, which is kind of playing into that as well. Not quite sure what point I'm making. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, embodiment is good. That's probably the first. Of, right. the first Why not? Well, just exploration. Yes. Like, um, I think there's uh, there is a really interesting thing, just uh, in a much bigger picture, that there, it's great to explore and it, go on a journey and mm. learn about ourselves as human beings and our options. So masks are sort of self-discovery. Yeah, very much right. so. So you can go into a pattern. You can explore an emotion or a pattern, or you can learn to become more neutral and both are uh, uh, they, they both are the connected they're two sides of the same coin hmm. um, and that's really it it's being able to access different things and mm. jump into to different characters and sort of and having that the enjoyment of it yeah and sort of having that vocabulary of knowing of the different places and the different things you can go to that sort of thing right yeah. yeah very much so there is this magical thing that happens with masks when a performer puts them on there is a moment when they suddenly click into state, and they're, they're you, you, from the outside. You just clearly see, oh, it's like a different person's in the room. Mm. You're like, wow, okay, oh, and for that performer, they suddenly know a lot more information than comes from the the conscious mind. Right. They they know where to stand in the room. They know how to move. They know actually what kind of sports that that character would like. What job they have. Suddenly, a whole whole world opens up. And it comes from a very different place. Mm. Um, it's not a conscious thought out thing, it's just something that you know. Yeah. Um, and that's very fascinating. And so presumably, once you've had experience of mask work, would you imagine wearing a mask? Well, this is the thing, is that as a training tool, you can explore and you can, uh, with mask work, you can, uh, you can take a mask and improvise with that mask and get a lot of material of how that character would move. Right, yes. And then you can take that mask off right. and you can form all the knowledge that you gained on while stage and you have all this, ah. all this information, all this knowledge. Cool, that's really good. Mm. That's really interesting. Mm. So you, you run training on masks? You train people how to use masks? What sort of experiences have you had doing that? What sort of things yeah. do you teach? So a mixture of things. I work, I teach uh, workshops in character masks. And I also teach workshops on neutral masks. Right. So with the neutral mask, the first thing is working with the individual and really unfolding the patterns that are there and exploring, exploring what options someone has in their, their body for movement. Hmm. And then the second thing is using neutral mask to work with choral movement. Right. So working with groups. And with this, there's a very interesting thing. With the, within the lookup based work, there is something called the journey. So you go through different landscapes, such as the forest, the savanna. You maybe go up a mountain, out to the sea. And there's, it's very interesting when we create um, natural spaces or when we create imagined space. There is an interesting connection to our posture. Right. Yes. In that the type of spaces that we imagine is also connected to the vector or the vector of movement in our body oh, right. okay. and that's really fascinating that's actually the first, that's what got me into the work right. is that from working as a postural therapist and working with the body and understanding different dynamics of movement 
um, seeing the direct connection between the dynamic within someone's body and the space that they perceive or the space that they imagine. Mm. So if if we were walk, you know going through an imaginary forest, what would our how would that affect our? So for example, somebody with a really upward dynamic or an upward forward, you know, so coming up through the chest and out in a very very big front space in their body. Say if they're walking through a forest, they would probably. What I've seen is that they actually those dynamics then create those people create forests that are very tall that are very with very kind of a lot of space with a lot a lot of width between the trees there's all of that openness within mm. it and a lot of in terms of creating the space yeah. it's all up in the branches right whereas someone else with a very different body dynamic with a different vector will actually create a, com a very different uh, forest of very dense trees yeah. with a lot of, they'll take note of the flowers on the ground they will be pulled down in that way right that's really interesting so not only I could sort of see how that would work in sort of the way of a self-discovery I mean you could potentially tell about could you tell things about yourself through the forest type of forest you created yeah right I, I think uh, the biggest thing to note is that there is a connection between our imagined space, mm. the area that we, if we were a painter, what we paint, and our, our dynamics, mm. of our postural dynamics, wow. and also the way in which we perceive or interpret data. So if you're a scientist, you may actually have a bias in how you interpret neutral data linked into the way in which you're holding the body. Wow. So as a way of exploring the world, it's a really incredible thing yeah. to explore the different postural dynamics we can have within our bodies. So a scientist, you say a scientist would interpret data in a certain way due to their posture? So it's us, how does that yeah, work? it's our subjective reality. Yeah. It's how our reality is influenced and it's, there's a direct body-mind connection. So if we changed our posture, we'd change our, the way in which we perceive the world? Yes. Right, okay. Yes. And with that, mask work is a way of exploring the world ah. in different postures and different realities. Right, yeah. So I, yeah, so I can see how that would work for both um, yeah, for everyday life and, and then also in the theatre. It's giving you more options, more way to approach things. Exactly. Oh, that's really interesting. What's your, what's your favourite mask? Oh gosh, well, oh, my favourite mask, if you're asking in as a general question, I'd say the neutral mask, just because it's every time I work with it, it's just unbelievable in terms of what it unlocks and how, the tool that it is, is phenomenal. What does it unlock? Uh, in just in terms of discovery yeah, for yeah. everyone. And, but really in terms of, if it was a character mask, there is this wild half mask um, that a colleague of mine shaped and created. And when I play it, I become uh, Ma Margaret, so uh, like Margaret Thatcher. Right. And uh, <laughs> she's, a, she's a rather wonderful character that I came across a number of years ago. And oh gosh, yes, <laughs> she's, you know, very far. And uh, it's very interesting uh, exploring that. And um, she's someone that I probably would have hated when I first <laughs> discovered her. Um, it's probably the, the yeah the real extreme of what I I don't I don't gravitate towards. But then also, well through playing her, yes. I've so I, she's great. She's got <laughs> qualities that I don't have, and yeah, it's great. It's great. So if you if you're working with the same mask. You, you, you return to the same character or you can return to the same character? Right, so we, yes, um, typically two things really. Um, the first is that yes, when someone tries on a mask, they'll normally, they'll find one character. Right. So when they put that mask back on, you know, any time over that next year, then yes, they will return to the same character, they'll have the same vocal resonance with that character. If you play that character a lot, yes. over years and years and years, then there are small changes that occur. Really? What mm. sort of...? It just changes. Yeah, it just evolves. It's something, interestingly, it's almost like the body is playing this character, and then after a while, the charge, the energy behind it, shifts. 
Yeah. And so, yeah, I think masks are medicine, you know, in terms right. of playing these different archetypes, playing these different characters. And it changes over time. Yeah. Wow. That's really interesting that, you know, you would... Yeah, the, the idea of accessing the same character over a period of time is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's really clever. They say there's a really beautiful quote, which is, what is not expressed is impressed in the body. All right. And there's a really interesting connection between theatre and therapeutic work, um, to the point that the ancient Greeks, in the heart of their healing centres, was amphitheatres. So you oh, would wow. actually play your condition. Wow. And that, through playing, there's a real release. You are not the condition, and there is an amazing... Uh, it's a process of transformation. We um, we have uh, yeah quite often with podcasts the idea of uh, improv as therapy uh, huh. comes up. Yeah. I think Mark Johnson uh, finessed that to improv maybe therapy, but it's not counselling. Right. <laughs> I mean, unless you right. unless you've got your own podcast, it slightly <laughs> is slightly is counselling. But uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, so it's uh, both a cathartic release for the performers and for the audience. Right. Yeah. I think theatre's as magic as theatre. <laughs> yeah. You know? We love theatre. Like, it's yeah. great to watch <laughs> an experience and connect with other human, like, other people just, you know, and incredible stories. And also just playing them, it's great. It's great yeah. fun. Tapping into the fun. Um, so you mentioned that you do um, theatre, uh, not theatre, sorry, character workshops with yes. the masks. So yes. there are other types of workshops that you do? Yes, I also do uh, neutral mask workshops. Oh, right, yeah. So yeah. those yeah. are the, the two main ones at the moment. Right, okay. Yeah. So um, if you're doing a character um, workshop, how would you, what, 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 what would someone experience in that? Right. Well, they come along and they try out the different masks. Yeah. And um, yeah, similar to the, so basically I have a different sets of masks. The ones I have are the white the white lava masks and also full masks and half masks. So it's a really great journey. You go through the different ones and it's really interesting because you turn up, you put a mask on and actually the key with mask work is um, to do much less than you ever think. Right, okay. You, don't, you just have to stand there and breathe yeah. and be in contact with the audience and things just begin to happen. Right. And that's, that's, the, that's the key really. What sort of things begin to happen? Um, there's something about a biofeedback experience that happens when we're in when we are in ice, you know, kind of in sight connection with another human being. Yeah. And that's when someone wears a mask and breathes. You just suddenly get a sense of oh, actually, I don't, you just get a sense. Your body begins to change. Really, really subtle movements, and you you might get a sense of an like an emotion or you might go oh I want to plod over to the outside of the room or you might go <laughs> oh this but or you might just want to stand there for a while and yeah that's actually uh, the biggest part of, with, of mask work so do is I'm just you know, trying to think about how the, you know sort of the workshop works does everybody try on the masks at the same time or do oh, they right. do one at a time and there's an audience or oh, gosh Oh, I see, I see. Logistics. Let's have logistics yeah, yeah, here. Well, yeah, How does just... it work? <laughs> right. Give me all your secrets. Right, OK. So on a logistical level of a mask workshop, um, typically there'll be a number of things just firstly working with the body, like working with um, a bit of partner, movement, just warming up, basically. Right, yeah. That's the first thing. You've got to have your body alive. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, you can't just... Stomp yes. out of bed and be like, oh, I'm going to do masks. <laughs> like, you need to have a bit of like, woo, you know. Um, yeah, so you need to firstly warm up. Right. Then uh, from there, you can then, you know, kind of one person will select a mask and go up and stand and, you know, kind of see. There's also a possibility of the first way of getting into masks is just to pick up one. Everyone picks up a mask and you have a look at it. And you see, you know, and you almost use it as a puppet, so you don't put it on your oh, face. Wow. You just yeah. look at it and just see, like, how it would move, how it, you know, where would it look at, you know, kind of how it, you know, kind of how you would interact with it, you know, wow. like how you think about it. Yeah. And then uh, from there, you might, you know, have a sound. It might have, you know, it might have yeah. a certain way of speaking, uh, or it might have a, you know, little a little mumble, and it might look at certain things around the room, and you just spend time with that. And then after a while, you can put it on and just see how, 
how that is. Yeah. Um, and that's just by, you know, kind of by yourselves, you can play around with masks like that. And then from there, coming out and being in front of a, you know, kind of a few people and just seeing what, you know, kind of what works. The key with mask work is it's really important to have people there. Right. There's, there is a feedback mechanism and, yeah, people watching and, you know, responding, just small responses, you begin to pick up what works and what doesn't. And that sounds a little bit like an exercise in clowning that I've heard about where you're told to make the audience happy. Oh. But without... <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's probably, it's probably a different thing. But I, think, but I think that's more about being funny, um, but trying to make the audience um, sort of happy. And then you try and do something and then it's not funny. And then, uh, and then you sort of express your disappointment and that sort of gets a laugh or something like that. That sounds like oh. a different, maybe I'm off on a different tangent. Well, yes. And also there are, I think there are different approaches to clown work as well. Um, some of the most powerful clown work that I've seen is actually when someone just stands there on stage and maintains eye contact and continues breathing and just see what happens. Yeah. Um, we are like, we are all insanely stupid. Like we don't need, we don't need to do anything. Like you don't have to be funny. And that's probably the scariest thing, right? Yeah, is yeah. to turn up on stage and think, oh God, I've got to be funny. Or, yeah. oh God, I've got to play a trumpet in a silly way or something. <laughs> and actually there's a myriad of clowns there can be sad clowns, there can be all these different types and actually if you turn up and the whole thing is not to create anything in your mind, if you create stuff in your mind it's not funny and it dies but if you, it's really tough clown yeah. work because you walk out on stage and you just, you know, especially if you're in the first stages finding your clown then yeah, you go out on stage and you just breathe and just don't know what's going to happen yeah. and you might, you know, take, you know, you might just go out there and feel really sad or you might actually you might not <laughs> want to go out there and might, feel really sad I could right, probably do that you being clan then but um right but it's all about just really honestly sharing that yeah. and being and with that and seeing what comes up and that's really interesting yes and you might want to go and hide in the corner or you might find certain movements coming into your hands you might suddenly clench them or you might suddenly find your leg shaking and that's actually the body beginning like that's that is the way in yeah. It's the doorway into clown. It's the body processing a huge amount of energy while being up on stage, and it's it's those 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 aspects that are a doorway in. Yes. Um, but it's amazing. It's an amazing practice. Really, in some ways, you know, in some ways scary, but it's also got its, you know, it yes. has it, it it has its result, not results, but like it has its incredible rewards as well with it. I mean, I've talked a lot on this podcast about planning from a position of ignorance, but thankfully... <laughs> right. I mean, I don't mind admitting that. Oh, no, so, that's, you know. But that, that's, that's, why, that's why I'm doing the podcast, so I may learn from people more knowledgeable than I am, but I will at some point do do uh, some planning just so I can understand properly. And, you know, and I, I think if I'm going to be afraid, I want to have it as a... <laughs> I want this fear to be from a place of knowledge rather right. than from a place of ignorance, if I, right. if I am going to be afraid. Right. And maybe just and maybe go out there and be really scared. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just breathe a lot. Yes. A lot. <laughs> they um, there's a, like uh, another thing is that they say uh, that fear is excitement without breath. Oh right. Okay. Yes. So actually, you know, when we're afraid, uh, what happens is our body closes down. It stops breathing. And if we can breathe, then you'll begin to feel like a, a flow of excitement come through. Right. Yeah. No. I've I've um I've uh, understand sort of with um, excitement and fear how they're. It's easier to transfer from fear to excitement than it is to try and just calm down. If people say it's easier to calm down, that's actually really difficult. But if you're afraid and actually you're moving into excitement, but that's really interesting. That, you know the way in which you say it's it's breath, it's yeah, it's control. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, um, no, not control. No. <laughs> well, it's it's just important to breathe. <laughs> yes. Um, any of our listeners out there, that's the takeaway message for today's <laughs> yeah, right, episode. Right, watch oh, breathe, out. Breathe, breathe, it's yeah. really important. Please keep on doing that, that would be really good. These are real golden nuggets, people. <laughs> 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 I've yeah. been listening for 35 minutes and then finally they got to the stuff that really interested me. Hey, so we should carry on breathing. Yes, yeah. do that, that would yeah. be good. <laughs> yeah. No, but... Uh... So what sort of people do you get coming along to your workshops then? A real mixture, actually. Yeah. Um, some groups of workshops I work with theatre performers, so right. 
uh, people who are either training as actors or are already actors. Um, the other side of things is I've also opened up some workshops for body workers. So people right. with a similar background to, to myself in terms of movement therapy, in terms of uh, understanding uh, the body but from a different modality right. and who are interested in exploring other, other practices and are interested in, in exploring theatre. Yeah. So you, you said that you got into, you, know, you sort of journey started with this movement therapy. Yeah. How, what sort of what sort of things do you mean? Right. So I yes I I um I went and studied something called structural integration. Right. Out in America, out in Colorado, and it is a practice. It's very similar to Feldenkrais, if you've heard of that, and it's also similar to it's got connections to the Alexander technique. I've heard of Alexander technique, yeah. And and also osteopathy. Right. So, it is a process with structural integration. It's also known as Rolfing. Oh, I've heard of Rolfing. Okay. Yes. So there we are. Yeah, it's got its different names, but structural integration or Rolfing, they're the same thing. And it's a process of 10 sessions that unfolds the body. So it's through working, it's like a deep tissue massage and guided movement, but it's working in very, very specific areas of the body. And there's a really incredible unfolding that can occur. And that, that occurs... Um, it's all connected to creating alignment with gravity. Oh wow! And yeah, it's it's really yeah, it's an incredible practice. When I experienced it, I grew <laughs> I grew over an inch. Really? I, wow! Um, <laughs> so it was, that was really yeah, it was a cool experience. That's yeah, amazing, right? Um, so if um, if someone was interested in getting no, learning more about masks and right. using masks, what? What would be their next step? What advice would you give them? Where, where should they start? Right. Oh, it depends where you are. Right. In the world. Yes. So that's, that's very important the about thing. the journey. You've got, to, <laughs> you've got to know where you are before you can work out how you're going to get yeah. there. Nugget number two. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about the nuggets. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's in, like, depending on where you are, there's different mask workarounds. Right. Um, so it's finding what's near you. Uh, but for example, in London, um, so for I run workshops. There's also other. There's one or two other people that work um, with Camila Delatte masks. Right. And yes, and, then, and within the UK at the moment, there's about five or six uh, different mask companies or different mask makers hmm. uh, behind the scenes, as it were. So. Um, so find so if you type in you know Google masks wherever you are find your local companies and they will be work, they'll be running workshops and, yeah, and of course uh, contact you via the link in the show notes we'll get that <laughs> yes right uh, um, <laughs> so yeah just um, sort of uh, final sort of point you say that you make the masks is yeah. this is this because they say with tarot cards I'm not saying it's the same thing okay but you should never <laughs> buy a pack of tarot cards they should be given to you so yeah. is there something about making the mask, or is it, is it legitimate if you're working with masks? Should you make the masks yourself? Ooh. What are the advantages to that? Oh, I, don't, I don't know about the tarot card <laughs> link myself. There's no link there anyway. whatsoever. That was a, a spurious connection <laughs> that I made. Um, it's definitely the process of making masks is is really incredible. I studied it with a gentle, gentleman called Matteo Destra over in Italy, and the way in which um, he makes masks is via creating the clay form and then creating papier-mâché um, from there and it, it creates really great masks. There's, there's a certain whole process of polishing and, and painting them in specific ways to make them work. But the key behind mask making is creating the volume, so creating the shape that works mm. and that is a real art form. Um, Matteo has worked for years and years on this and is incredible and it was it was great I was you know I was able to learn it for two years with him um, and just just to continue has been yeah, brilliant mm. each time it depends there's a number of different processes of how you go about starting or whether you have a provocation or whether there's a certain type of character you're wanting to create right and is the way in which you interact with the mask different if you've created the mask or do you have a relationship with the mask before you put it on I would say uh, yes and no. In terms of playing, you can play any masks. Right. Uh, in terms of the masks that you've made, I'm sure there's some underlying connections in some way, shape or form. Um, but yeah, it's just fun to play them, really. Brilliant. 
Thank you very much indeed. That was Thank fascinating. You very much, that was really good. It's been great. Great to be here. Thank you. Uh, the who, what, where in a park by Waterloo Station right. uh, with <laughs> builders on one side, <laughs> football on the other, buses going by. That was brilliant. Uh, yeah, I have to say thank you very much indeed. Thank that was really good. I made this. That's improv! <laughs>